Hey, welcome back to Point Black. Uh, today's show is going to be real, real interesting. It's going to be a very interesting, very informative show. And, of course, I couldn't do this by myself, sitting to my right, my immediate right, my right-hand man, the only one in this place with some sense. Uh, why don't you introduce yourself? <laughs> Reverend Daryl Gray, I am the uh, Director General for Social Justice for the National Progressive Baptist Convention, um, among a, a plethora of other things. But in this particular case, in this space, I serve as the co-host for Point Black. And uh, listen, uh, Adolphus, last last week you mentioned something very interesting uh, as we were going through uh, the exit polls. You said it was just very surprising to you that out of all of the major issues that public safety uh, seemed to be down uh, on the lower end of the spectrum as related to what motivated people going to the polls. And you have put together a pretty impressive uh, lineup for the show today. Why don't you go ahead and introduce our guests? Well, you know, uh, Daryl, if we're going to talk about public safety locally in the city of St. Louis, uh, there's no better person to have that discussion with than the director of public safety for the city of St. Louis, ex St. Louis City Police Chief, and a and, and, and let me say, doctor, doctor. Dr. <laughs> Daniel Isom <laughs> is going to join us on the show. How you doing, Dan? I'm doing well. It's uh, great to be with you all here on uh, Point Black, um, certainly with um, you, Adolphus, and my frat brother, Reverend Gray. All right. Now, you might as well go ahead and tell him that, Dan. Now, listen. Now, you know you rubbed him wrong already. He's running around <laughs> here with all this red, and he, he calls it crimson and cream. I call it red and white. Running around here with all this red and white, little candy canes and all of that. But, you know, it's all good. It's all good. But it's, good to, it's good to have you on the show, frat. Yeah, it, I'm just glad to know that Omega recognizes that Kappa's are in the room. I'm just, I'm, I'm just glad to do that. But also, um, when we st talk about public safety on the national level, but especially in the St. Louis region, the eastern part of Missouri, mm -hmm. um, you know, we just can't do much better than to have the special agent in charge for the St. Louis branch of the. Federal Bureau of Investigation, FBI, FBI, my friend, Jay Greenberg. Thank you, and thank you for having me on the show. Jay Greenberg, uh, Special Agent in Charge, FBI St. Louis, been here about six months. It is really a pleasure to be here with you and with uh, Dr. Isom, who is obviously a local celebrity when it comes to all things policing <laughs> in the St. Louis area. You know, Jay, it's, uh, you know, we, we talk we talked about this off air, but uh, you know, initially when when you have the NAACP and and uh, SCLC veteran activists, you know, it's it's so uncommon uh, that you would have the FBI, the public safety director, the president of the NAACP, and one of the local political rabble rousers in the same room. But it was it it was just that important. I think when you look at what's going on. Uh, not just in St. Louis, but around the country, uh, you would think that public safety, crime prevention uh, would would really be front and center on people's minds, uh, and particularly in this last election, but it wasn't. I mean, with, with Pruitt, I mean, I want to ask Jay first, and 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 then I know go, you've got go, some, go. you got, listen, you got the real go, go. Uh, insightful questions. I mean, but but Jay, why? You know, and I, I know the Bureau keeps the stats. I know you guys follow the research. I know you have the data. But but after what we just saw, you know, the mass shootings that have taken place, mm -hmm. the recent one. Yeah. Uh, and then two reason two. two recent two this week. Uh -huh. Mass shootings, uh, January 6th, uh, hate crimes, uh, you know, the, the cultural conflicts, all of that. Why, Jay? Yeah, so I can't talk to why the exit polls didn't have anything, didn't have public safety ranked higher. I will tell you that here in St. Louis, for us in the FBI and at all of our offices and for every major metropolitan police department, I'll let, I'll let Dan talk about that more here locally, but public safety is job number one for all of us in one way or another. And so whether it's on the mind of the populace or not today, you know, is we don't move resources that quickly across our departments and across the nation addressing it. 
So we have a steady complement of resources who constantly work violent crime. It has been a priority for us. It remains a priority for us. You know, numbers fluctuate year to year, and they're driven by a number of different factors. Mm -hmm. But what we see is this. When I, every time I've been in one of our vulnerable communities, a community that's a high crime community, they want us there. They want police there. What the communities have asked for the last couple of years is police that they know are fair mm -hmm. and police they can trust. Mm -hmm. But in none of those high crime communities have I ever heard a single community member come to me or one of my people and say, we don't want you here. Nobody in those vulnerable communities wants to dial 911 and then wonder if somebody is coming. They all want to know that the police are here and that we are just as dedicated and professional. And what they are asking is that we're respectful and that we are engaged with them and that we know the difference between a subject and a victim in that community, mm -hmm. just like we do everywhere else. And we owe that to the people. That's a very reasonable ask for them. But as I sit here today in my conversations with you know, Mike Sack, who's currently running St. Louis Metro, and in my conversations with Dan and others around the city, we are all dedicated to making sure that we have an effective police force here, that when you need help and you call for help, that the right kind of help arrives. Hey, Dan, you want to take a piece of that? Yeah, I mean, when, when I think about national polls like that that take a snapshot of what people are thinking it it reminds me of the old saying that all politics is local mm -hmm. um, for urban areas across the united states um, i would imagine if you poll individuals within cities whether it's st louis memphis chicago uh, you will find that public safety is at the top of people's minds. But what it also speaks is to the divide between the urban areas and the suburban rural mm -hmm. areas in America. Um, certainly, when you talk about um, public safety, gun violence, uh, whether it's the day-to-day -day violence we experience in these urban cities or uh, the mass shootings that tend to happen more so in urban areas, but sometimes, of course, on college campuses. Um, those are things that speak to the division, and I think in our community, and the division in our politics. Um, urban and suburban areas are not affected by this issue as much, so they don't put it high on their sort of uh, list of things that concern them. Got it. So let me, I'm going to go backwards for a minute, though. Dan and Jay, I'm going to ask you both, let the people, sometimes folk don't understand that irregardless of what your profession is, that you are just like anybody else, any one of their neighbors. Mm -hmm. you, you're not much different from any of us other than your profession may be law enforcement, mine may be uh, uh, real estate development, Daryl's may be as a, as a pastor of his church, but, but, we all are, are individuals uh, in, in many ways uh, are, are like the same. So what I would love for you to do, for you and Jay both to talk about, why did you choose law enforcement as, as, as a career? And, 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 and now that you've done it for such a long time, what's your thoughts about it? Uh, and, and, and at the same time, talk about how it impacts or didn't impact you and your family, maintaining your family life. Because, of course, just like my loved ones want to, want to make sure I come home when I leave the house, mm -hmm. yours have to do the same thing, and, and they have to do it at a at a higher level than mine because I'm not in law enforcement. You want to well, I think um, just a little you know, history about my background. I grew up in the city of St. Louis. Um, I have lived in St. Louis City my entire life. So even before I became a police officer and, and after um, I became a police officer, you know, one of the things that I think speaks to um, at least my life and how I'm just like every other St. Louis and, um, you know, my family has been um, in public service for, for many years. My mother was a teacher for uh, 40 years in St. Louis public schools. Um, my father started as a firefighter for the St. Louis Fire Department. 
Uh, he ended up um, moving on to other jobs within uh, the city government. Uh, he actually was a, a committeeman at one time for the 27th Ward. Uh, he actually was um, serving with um, Mayor Tashara Jones's father at the time, who was the alderman of the 27th Ward. Uh, and then my father ultimately uh, worked for the uh, Parkway School District for over 20 years. So, you know, I have a, a background uh, and a family history in public service. Uh, originally, um, I thought about becoming a lawyer, uh, but ended up uh, moving into the policing profession. And, you know, it's really just been an honor for me to serve the community that I grew up in. Um, and have been a part of for my entire life. Um, certainly, as you suggest, <clears throat> um, you know, your family worries about you in this profession, um, but they also understand that, um, you know, you're providing uh, a service to the community, and um, they support that. But they're also, you know, worried about me over the years being um, a, a police officer. So, you know, I think I say it's in my blood, public service, because uh, my parents have been public servants uh, throughout their lives. And so I think that's what moved me towards uh, this sort of career path that I've had for years. Jay? Yeah, so I, uh, unlike Dan and probably everybody else in the room, I grew up outside Dallas. Um, I studied uh, engineering in college, but as I was trying to figure out what to do with my life, I always knew I'd wanted to serve in some capacity, military, law enforcement, something like that. My dad was drafted in Vietnam and served uh, in the Army during Vietnam. And so as I was trying to kind of find my way in life, you know, he approached me and said, listen, he said, I don't, I don't want to tell you what to do with your life, but somebody who argues as much as you do should never go into the military, right? <laughs> you just... You don't stand a chance in the military. I wish my dad had told yeah. me that. So, so I, I put that. I kind of put that on the side, and I took my engineering degree. I worked in management and technical consulting for a number of years, almost a decade, and then the call to serve came back stronger. And so, you know, in, in my after a decade of working or so, just under, um, I applied to the FBI. My wife thought it was a midlife crisis in my late twenties. Right? She didn't know what to make of it. The late 20s. Yeah. So, so the, uh, but the FBI, you know, we hire people from all backgrounds and we just happened to be doing a hiring push at that time for engineers and people with technical background. And so I went through the process very quickly. And within the next year I was in the Academy going through, um, having sworn. And I'll tell you over the last, you know, 17 plus years, there's not a day that's gone by that I almost beat my alarm clock up every day because the, the responsibility we have is tremendous. It is great. It is broad. We can focus on a variety of things any given day from national security to violent crime, public corruption, civil rights, financial crimes, et cetera. But every single day, there are a number of challenges that need to be fixed that day or need to, efforts that need to be started that day, even mm -hmm. if they're not going to be finished that day. And so I have just thoroughly enjoyed serving the communities where I live. You know, you, you mentioned Adolphus something a little bit earlier that I think is is worth sort of talking about from a cop's perspective, which is every one of us in the country really wants the same things. It doesn't matter what our skin color is, what our religion is. We want a safe place to live. We want good schools for our kids. We want jobs to go to. We want food security. We want to have a life with some laughter and with some love and with some enrichment along the way and opportunity for the next generation that's better than what we feel like we had. And police officers are no different. We police the communities where we live. And so each one of us brings that hope for the next generation of the country into our job every single day. And that's really a privilege and an honor. So we, we, we want to talk about that because I think it, it's important. Uh, I mean, we, we need to see law enforcement uh, officials as people uh, and not just as badges and, and guns and uniforms. And we want to talk about that. And we want to talk about how, how that, your own personalities and backgrounds and everything uh, comes to play with how you police. We want, we're going to talk about community engagement. Maybe we'll talk about 21st century policing. We don't know, but whatever we talk about, we won't talk about it right now. We're going to talk about it when we come back from a commercial break. Y'all stay tuned. This is Point Black on Hallelujah AM 1600. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Point Black. 
Did I get it right you this time? It, you got it right. You got it right. Everybody, listen, everybody pause. Did you, did listen. You, what, did, you, did you hear the pause? Ladies and gentlemen, even when I'm wrong, I'm right. Hey. <laughs> now you're sounding like my grandmother. I may not always be right, but I'm never wrong. You know, you know, folks, uh, welcome back. You, you joining us. We were in a conversation with both the uh, director of public safety for the city of St. Louis, uh, Dan Isom, and also Jay uh, Greenberg, the uh, special agent in charge for the St. Louis office of the, of the FBI. And we had just we just got off the conversation where they were sharing with, with us all their background and, and how they feel about the profession. And, and so I, I, we and we did that because we want you to be able to connect with our, our with our, with the people on the show. We want our audience to be able to connect with the people because these are simply just some conversations. We want you to feel as if we are asking and having a conversation that you would have if you were sitting here in these chairs. And so if we fail to do that. Don't 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 hold it against us. Just call us and tell us to get better at it. And and we will. But Here's my next question, both to both Jay and and to Dan. I tell you this: the most interesting thing about both of your professions is people misunderstand, I believe, how you all engage with people from a law enforcement perspective. Because then, when you see police, the understanding is police patrol. They see a crime, they engage with the criminal. Or you get a call from 911, they engage with the criminal. And there may be other ways that you all engage. And people people have no idea of how the FBI engages uh, uh, mm -hmm. when it comes to, because uh, you don't patrol the street and this and that. They have no idea. So I don't know, Jay, even how much you can talk about that. But it would be great for people to understand how both of these agencies engage the public as it relates to dealing with crime and criminals mm -hmm. and then from there we we'll talk about how you engage the public as it relates to building a uh, 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 police community relationships or, or or for me just you know and, and i'm 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 the slow one in the room or or how you see community engagement emerging yes you know one of those i mean i i agree with pruitt uh if an fbi agent comes and knocks on your door I don't know what kind of engagement we got going there, <laughs> but 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 if a police officer come, that that police officer local may be coming because somebody down the street made a call and you're coming yeah. just to ask a question. Yeah. So even the dynamics of it is just, I'd be interested to, I'd like to hear that that answer, Jay. Because if you knock on my door, I'm gonna tell you right now, have somebody at the back, I'm out, baby. <laughs> yeah. So no. you know, we'll we'll talk about how we work together and sure. how we engage the community for sure. You know, a number of the cases that I worked, I would get invited in when I was a street agent in Washington D.C. as it. part of our Washington field office because sometimes we thought there was going to be a great deal of public engagement required, and okay. we thought that having the FBI brand in a couple of neighborhoods might get better community engagement or more responsiveness when we knocked on a door and said, hey, we need to get your side gotcha. of something. We need to figure something out. Okay. Got it. So the partnerships across the nation, they're all a little bit different, but they're incredibly strong between local police and federal police everywhere we go. When it comes to community engagement and where we're going, I will tell you where we're seeing sort of our mission go and where our mission is going nationwide and internationally is that the world is shrinking. And it's really rare to have a single crime type that we're looking at anymore, right? We may be investigating drugs and all of a sudden a violent crime pops up. Mm -hmm. Maybe investigating drugs and violent crime and the next thing we know there's a nexus to public corruption. And we're investigating public corruption and all of a sudden there's a foreign nation who's injecting money into an election that we got to get to the bottom of as well. So we're starting to see all of our threats get a little bit more complicated, whether it's cyber, counterintelligence, counterterrorism, violent crime, public corruption. It's all blending. And so we're starting to put our people into interdisciplinary teams where we've got a public corruption agent, a violent crime agent, counterintelligence agent, a local police officer, a state police officer working together in a team so that as we're figuring out what's happening in an area, we're not just asking the question, where does somebody get the most jail time? It's where do we do the best good for mm -hmm. this community got it. and for the global community in our investigation and in how we work together. Got it. Hey, Dan? Yeah, so, you know, I, I think we try to engage the community in several different ways. Of course, there are many community meetings that um, our captains, lieutenants, and sergeants go to. 
Um, that's something that happens on a regular basis. Um, but oftentimes the people who come to those meetings often come on a regular basis. And so we also are very much engaged in, you know, social media or traditional media trying to push information out to the community. But there's also special events that we might have. Um, it could be a picnic. It could be a sporting event. Um, it could just be showing up at a park uh, to engage young people at a park. But right now we're going through a process um, with that same agency that uh, you talked about, Adolphus, the uh, Center for Policing Equity, to really think about um, what community engagement looks like on an everyday basis with officers on patrol. So what do we expect of them um, in their patrols on a daily basis to engage the community? I mean, is, is it, you know, talking to people in schools or young people in schools? Is it talking to business owners or is it showing up at a park just to um, engage community members who are, you know, having fun on a weekend, Saturday or Sunday? So we are really actively engaged in trying to build a stronger uh, community engagement policy and program that would be directly um, centered towards officers on the street. You know, Dan, I'm I'm always I guess one of my roles is is to to always identify the elephant in the room. I mean, I I hear Jay talking about the brand and you know, we're a long way from the the 50s and the 60s and the civil rights and the contention between civil rights organizations and FBI. So we're a long way from that. Uh and so as Jay says in the DC area and others, you know, when you come in with that with that brand, FBI uh, you know, it's that's a whoosh moment. That's like, woo. Uh, but talk about, I mean, that's important. But locally, you know, we, you know we're, we're, we're short all over the country. We're short police officers all over the country. It's not just St. Louis. Uh, people of color, black and brown people, bit apprehensive about, you know, going into law enforcement. Uh for some good reason, for some bad reason, some of it doesn't matter. How, what, so when we talk about that, I think for folk that I talk to on a regular basis, we, we, we would like to hear from the director of public safety and from the special agent in charge. How do you, you know, knowing that, that there's that contention, that contentiousness, uh, law enforcement and minority communities, it's real. How, how do you police yourselves? Uh, and how do you then measure its effectiveness? Jay and, and Dan, whoever wants to go first. Oh, well, the silence yeah. in the room. Come on, Dan. No, no I, I do think, I do think it is, it is real. And, um, but I, I don't know that is pervasive. Okay. Um, we mentioned it in the break. Um, when you look at surveys of, communities of color, um, you find that there is significant support uh, for law enforcement in those communities. Uh, I think we've all mentioned it before. It's not as if uh, communities of color uh, don't want police. Mm -hmm. uh, they certainly do want police and they do want public safety. They just want fair and efficient policing. Um, and so th that is, is really the key to, you know, how we sustain and build strong relationships in the community. So I think there are a number of different things. Um, and, and we've moved down this road, both, um, you know, Adolphus and Reverend Gray, is to put together a strong oversight system. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, Mayor Jones, with, with you all support and leadership, has uh, created one of the um, best structured oversight um, organizations, I think, in the nation. And I think as, as that starts to be built out, um, that's one mechanism that will give people confidence that uh, when things do happen, uh, there is an independent agency who could provide oversight. Um, you know, I think body-worn cameras has been something that has really helped uh, mm -hmm. um, when you have a, a neutral uh, recording of what's happened. I think that does a lot to 
not only uh, lower the temperature thing when things happen, but gives people confidence that there is that measure of oversight, there is that measure of independence that you see. And then I think ultimately the challenge of law enforcement in urban areas is be more effective at public safety, right? Because many of the issues that we are facing in urban areas are a result of um, a, a lack of response to public safety in a way where people feel safe. And I think as long as you have conditions um, like we have in most urban areas, there is going to be uh, a frustration and a tension uh, between law enforcement and government in general because the government is not meeting uh, the needs of the people in the community. So, you know, we've got to do a better job of dealing with those issues within urban areas. And I think fundamentally when those are solved, uh, the relationship will become uh, much stronger. Yeah, Jay, and we see it more locally, but nationally. How 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 are we to to gauge and see uh, that that policing of yourself and that effectiveness? Because the FBI, for most people, is lo- is larger than life. Sure. So, you know, I'd like to go back to and Dan referenced this. You know, before when we were at a break, we were talking about this a little bit in the room. You know, the the FBI, you have to understand history to understand perception today and how you're going to be received from some that happened in the past, Mm -hmm. right? And the FBI has made major missteps in the history of our organization. Anything 110 years old is going to have made missteps along the way. And during the Civil Rights Movement, we made major missteps with the black community as as you were advocating for very correctly for equal rights. Mm -hmm and equal treatment and we didn't we didn't handle all that right now this is a different fbi when you come forward you know 50 years 60 years 70 years a very different fbi today Mm -hmm. that we're dealing with so let me talk local and then i'll pull back and talk nationally um we talked a little bit earlier that we're going to get to some recruiting you know i want to encourage everybody who's hearing this to be the change they want to see in the world. It's really easy to point a finger and say, you guys aren't doing this and you guys aren't doing that. Mm-hmm. And for anybody who feels that way, I would welcome a conversation with them, but I'm gonna caution them, right? Because my challenge at the end of that conversation is gonna be, hey, you raise a lot of good points and you come from a different place than I do. You know what would really help me out? Fill out an application, come on board, right? If, right. You, if you want that change to happen in the world, it's not going to happen organically. Mm-hmm. You have to help build that. So come on. I would love to hear from the community. If there's things we need to do differently or better, we're always open to that. Mm-hmm. But there will always be an open invitation to the community to join us and help us become what they want us to be. So nationally, um, I'll talk about one local program, then I'll pull back nationally. So we have an agent who's from St. Louis originally. He grew up in North City. Um, Matthews Dickey Boys and Girls Club was instrumental, he will tell you, in who he is today. Mm -hmm. And the man he is and the person he is, the husband he is, um, the agent he is, the opportunities that he has in life. And so because of his background, he brought into the office one day an idea, hey, it's going back to school time. A lot of the kids in the neighborhood where I grew up, they don't have backpacks. They don't have school supplies. Can we do a drive? Is that allowed? Can we do a, a fundraiser drive? And we, we looked at it, we sent it off to ethics, and we said, yes. Yes, we can, and yes, we should. And so, you know, I took it as a teachable moment for my young boys, right? We went out, and each one of them had to buy an age-appropriate backpack, and we filled it up with a list of supplies that were needed, and each one of them went through, and I explained to each one, one of my boys, hey, you're buying this backpack for a kid who otherwise may not have a backpack for school and may not have these school supplies available mm-hmm. to them. So you need to be both thankful that you have what we're providing to you in life And you need to be aware that there are others around you who don't have that same advantage. And we need to be part of lifting them up with the good fortune that we've had in life. And so I'm very proud to say that we had a a great afternoon on a Friday in uh, in August at Matthews Dickey. And we dropped off over 50 backpacks for kids who were supported in that neighborhood. And that was just the initiative of one agent Mm -hmm. who's on my rolls, who is here in the city and said, there's something we should do for our local community. We do that every day nationwide. We do uh, junior special agent. We do mentoring. We go into schools. We go into boys and girls clubs. We go in constantly. Now, how do we police ourselves and how do we know that we are the police that everybody wants us to Mm be? We have more oversight as part of the FBI. We have oversight from other branches of government. We have oversight from the U.S. Attorney's Office. We have 
oversight from our own internal investigations. We have oversight from the Office of Inspector General. There is a tremendous amount of ethical training, oversight, investigation, confirmation, every step of the way for each one of us. It starts with a really rigorous hiring process to only bring on people who will follow all the rules from the start. And then it goes all the way through. Anytime there's something questionable, we're always encouraged. Hey, we want you to self-report if you think you did something mm. that may call something into question. Just go ahead and te- just tell us so we don't find out about it and then wonder right. what really happened because you didn't tell us. Right. And so we have a very robust process for that. There's a lot of external oversight of us as employees and us as people uh, that, that we're subject to just by the very nature of our jobs. Yeah, and you know, I'm, on, I'm glad you said it, but I want to bring up a point. And it's, and it's unique because, then you know locally how there was this uproar at the Ferguson and all of this stuff about anti-police. Everybody hate police. Police no good and this and that. But it, it, it then things sort of changed after January the 6th and, and politics uh, uh, elections. Now, all of a sudden, uh, Dan, I mean, Jay, you guys are getting the same. <laughs> you know, you just – people now – and, 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 and it's, it's interesting because it's not necessarily coming out of the minority community. It's more coming from uh, uh, factions of the white community, and, and they're attacking the FBI and saying they're not this, they're not. And, it's, and we know it's all politically driven. So h- how are you guys faring with all of that lately? Is, 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 it, is it impacting your ability to uh, recruit and hire? And, and how's the morale going in, internally? Can you talk about that? I can. Yeah, I'd be happy to. So I will tell you that an FBI agent is a human like everybody else. And when we see on major media stations, you know, the FBI is corrupt from within. The FBI is full of these people. We're politically motivated. We're one side. We're the other side. We're everything. That wears on our people, mm-hmm. right? And we, every person does have, you know, personal beliefs that we bring to our job. But we know that when you clock in for the day, until you clock out for the day, it doesn't matter what your personal belief is. doesn't matter what TV station you watch at home. When you come to my office, you watch a mix mm-hmm. of TV stations throughout the day. We're not going to have a bias. And, um, you know, in my last role before I took this job as the head of St. Louis, I was in charge of half of our criminal investigations globally. And in that role, I used to brief the director and the deputy director every day, and then I would have separate briefings briefings with Director Ray on our sensitive public corruption investigations. And Director Ray has said a number of times, hey, seems like we're getting beat up by this side for this, and we're getting beat up (laughs) by that side for that. So as long as both sides are beating up on us, we're right. probably doing our jobs, do our job. right? right? Like any, right. any, that's any, right. any time we do our job, somebody's going to be unhappy with us in the political spectrum. But that's not really, that's not the area we look for our ultimate judgment is what's on the airwaves. We look for people like Dan, mm-hmm. people like St. Louis Metro and Missouri State Highway mm-hmm. Patrol and St. Louis Area Police Chiefs Association and the business community here and the communities we interact with. Those are the ultimate votes that we care about. And if I walk out and somebody says from one of those partners, hey, FBI, you guys are going wrong, they're going to get my attention. But more often than not, those people are not moved by what they're seeing on national airwaves. They see what we're doing every day, and and we are working well with them and for them, I hope. But if we're not, we want to hear about it. You know, uh, Dan, Tony Messenger uh, did a piece entitled Voters Reject Fearmongering Why Crime is Down in St. Louis and Other Cities. Uh, it, which is which is a good headline. Uh, it, it 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 sounds it's it sounds real good. One of the things that Adolphus really pushed us on in doing this particular show is to make sure uh, that we gave the audience some insight as to you know the complexities associated with crime fighting and uh, and to to give police officers an opportunity to kind of present themselves instead of us presenting them. Uh, you know, one of the things that, particularly with, with Adolphus, we, we talk about, okay, moving forward, uh, you know, what is it that, that we really need to be focusing on in our communities? Or is it just such a, a, a plethora of stuff that, you know, you know, what should we be looking at? What what should we be looking at? Uh, Pruitt says, what are the growing threats uh, in our community, be it locally, be it regionally? I mean, for me, I'll tell you very honestly, 
Uh, when I was working with SCLC in Atlanta, Pruitt, every quarter, every so often, with Dr. Joseph Lowry, the local FBI agent there, would brief us mm-hmm. uh, as to, you know, what chatter was going on, you know, as far as civil rights organizations, um, hate groups, supremacist groups. Uh, and that was that was mid-'80s. I don't know if much has changed. Dr. Lowry, you say everything has mm-hmm. changed, but nothing has changed. As, as we move forward, what should the community be looking at? Where where are you guys focusing? You talk about the resources. I know Dan says we don't have enough police, but together, jointly, what what should we be looking at? And uh, how do you intend to tackle them without, you know, without giving us any inside insider information? Pruitt wants insider information. I don't Dan, necessarily Dan want. Dan, spill the beans. <laughs> 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 What what should what what's the priority, Dan? What what should we be be looking out for, and and how can the community help? Well, you know, I go back to what Jay says, and I think it's so important is that you know everybody needs to be the change that they want to see uh, in this world. And you know, you started off, um, Reverend Gray, talking about you know the activist community and public safety, and you know, is there necessarily a role for the actors, this community and public safety. I think there's an extreme role um, because I think public safety for the African-American community uh, is the civil rights issue uh, of this generation. Interesting. Um, interesting. So, Hold so, on, Dan. Dan, repeat that, though. Yeah, we, yeah, we yeah. Make sure everybody Come hear on, that. Dan. I, I, Dan say, say that again, <laughs> Dan. Speak a little loud and put some bass in your voice. Say that again. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I seriously do think it is the civil rights issue of this generation okay. because it is affecting uh, poor uh, black and brown communities uh, more uh, than I think any time in the past. And it's becoming more entrenched and isolated for a particular group of uh, people of color. And so um, there are a number of different things that I think we've got to have a political movement for. And uh, I know... Jay can't get into politics uh, being in the FBI, but I know he's spoken about, um, you know, support for communities in a way that um, we really need to start advocating, um, not just on the local level, but on the state level uh, and also on the federal level. So we don't have enough substance abuse programs. We don't have enough mental health programs. We don't have enough counseling for people who are experiencing trauma in these neighborhoods. We don't have enough life skills programs for individuals who are in, um, you know, poverty stricken and public safety challenged neighborhoods. Um, You know, states and the federal government have to step up. Now, um, we all recognize that there are deficiencies, severe deficiencies in those areas, and we need to beef those up. But on the other end, um, there has to be some accountability uh, for people who are committing violent crimes or who are repeat offenders. Hold on for a minute, um, Dr. Is- Dr. Isom. Hold on for a minute. I did please put a pin in that. Hold that thought. We want to talk about this public safety, this new civil rights issue for this generation. And we want to hear from Jay, but we've got to take another break. We've got to pay some bills, y'all. You know, I, I don't know. I don't know about y'all. Pruitt can't afford to to can, to keep this show going on his own. So we've got to pay some bills. We're going to be right back in a couple of minutes with more of Point Black. Stay tuned. We're back uh, again, and uh, as we were leaving a few minutes ago, Doctor Isom, you were you were kind of you were calling the road, Doc. You public safety. One of the new civil rights issues of this generation, man. I I wrote that down. I'm gonna put it on a T-shirt. But but continue to talk about that. That you started going through some things that we needed to do, and then we definitely want to hear from Jay, uh, who is non-political, by the way. Well, I mean, I, I think it's very difficult for a community to thrive or move forward if public safety is not at the car, core. You know, going to school when you're worried about the trauma of what's happened in the neighborhood and succeeding is very difficult. Not impossible, uh, but challenging. And so we know it and we see it in St. Louis, and I know Jay has probably seen it in other areas 
these communities are becoming more isolated and more entrenched and more difficult to move out of this cycle of poverty and violence. And, and it's particularly um, affecting uh, communities of color. And, and so I do think public safety uh, is um, the next civil rights movement uh, of our generation. And uh, so, so that's one part of it. Uh, we've got to fight for the resources to improve people's lives, um, and not just on the local level. Right. But in addition to that, we, we have to hold people accountable. Uh, repeat offenders, and violent crime. There can be no excuses uh, for violent crime and repeat offending, especially once we give the proper amount of resources to try to uplift people. Uh, Jay, you want to chime in? I do. I want to underscore uh, everybody's point, which was rightly made, that I am apolitical, so I appreciate that. Uh, Thank you for that. Uh, Having said that, you know, I, I can't agree with Dan Moore that you know, our job as law enforcement officers is to enforce the law. And law enforcement is at its very foundation recognizing trends like a violent offender is somebody who will offend violently over and over and over and over until they are stopped. Mm-hmm. Now, that person may need help. That person may need resources. They may need training. They may need job opportunities. But our job is to stop that violent threat from presenting over and over in the community. And we need help from our prosecutive teams to get them locked up and get that community safe so that we can them, if there's a chance of rehabilitation or fixing them or giving them, putting them on a different path, we can do that without a community being terrorized at the same time. You asked earlier a question that we started with here, which was where do we see these threats going? And it leads me to something I really want somebody to take away from your show, Mm -hmm. which is, We are seeing more and more, it used to be if there was a robbery at a store, that robbery was conducted by a person from the neighborhood of the neighborhood. That still happens. But more and more, when we get into threats that are terrorizing our communities, our black churches, our historically black colleges and universities, Mm -hmm. our Jewish communities, our Muslim communities, our Catholic communities, Christian communities, every vulnerable community out there, we are seeing that the internet and the development of technology means that there could be a threat against something in St. Louis that's right here from St. Louis. But as often as not, we're seeing that threat come from somewhere else in the country or somewhere else in the world. And so where we need the community's help is if you experience a threat, you hear a threat, you get copied on a threat or you're notified of a threat. We need law enforcement to know about that and please don't pass it on on social media. It's going to take us a little bit of time to unwind where that threat came from. Mm -hmm. A lot of them are juveniles. They're almost all going to be handled through the state system wherever they live. That's how that system is built, more so than the federal system. We may team with local authorities starting here in St. Louis and then pushing out to another state or another country where they can then get to that person who levied that threat and stop them and get them away from devices where they can terrorize somebody. It could be a country that we just can't reach into. But until we know about the threat, we can't do anything about it. And what we're seeing is that people receive a threat or they hear about it and then they pass it on social media and it's passing that trauma around the whole community when we need time to investigate and stop that threat wherever it is. And and he's right. I'm, mm-hmm. I don't know, Darrell, I ever shared this story with you, but i never forget we got one call and this person was saying, it was right at the Ferguson and the person was saying what he was going to do to the black community if we didn't denounce uh, the the riots and stuff that was going on. And he was upset about it. And he left this long message and called. And I remember I shared it with the local office of the FBI. And and, and matter of fact, they told me I should have gave it to him earlier because when I got it, I'm like, well, who is this fool? Yeah, right, <laughs> right. And I took my time. But when they finally got it, i never forget within a few days after that, he got back with me and said, everything's okay. Well, in the ACP, everything's okay. We found us a guy down in Alabama who was actually, that's where the threat was coming from. And and but at, and at the same time, Dan, you talked about mental health. This guy had some mental health issues and had been doing this all the time. And and, and so that's, you know, so I heard. But, Jay, I, Jay, one other thing I wanted to make sure that I share. The first meeting I had with uh, Jay he said something that I've heard 
The past U.S. attorney say, I've heard uh, Dan say it. I hear it a lot. It's something they say a lot, but we never, we have to figure out how to do it. And, and they always say, we're not going to arrest our way out of crime. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We're not going to be able to lock everybody up to get rid of this crime problem. And, and, and it's, it's, so, it's the one thing that is so true, but it's so difficult to quantify <laughs> what, 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 what will work in, in the end of the day and resolve the problem to the, to the degree that we want. And so, uh, Dan and, and Jay, I guess my question to you, is there anything that you know of that really is working, that is really working and being effective at, at t- tapping down some of this violent crime? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll take a first cut, and then, Dan, you can clean this up. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so, I like the way you teamwork, think. teamwork. So, uh, let, let me just say it like this, right? There are many, many drivers behind violent crime. We know that from studies. That's a, that's a question for a sociologist, mm-hmm. right? That's a question for somebody besides me. I'm just a law enforcement officer who reads the laws on the books, investigates, puts people in jail. Okay. That's our job. That's our piece of fighting violent crime fair is enough, to get the people enough. who are terrorizing the communities out of the communities, Right. And on the federal system, you know, we send them to Bemidji, right? We send them to Washington State. We send them to Arizona. We get them out of the community when right, we get them right, out of the community, right, right? They're gone. But here's what that community needs now. It needs education that is training people and giving them opportunities. It needs family units that are supporting mm-hmm. them. It needs food security. It needs <clears throat> laws that they know how they're going to be enacted. It needs job opportunities. All of that works together, though. And so there are... I'm pleased to say that in my first few months here, I've been here six months now in St. Louis, this business community is hungry for reduced crime so that the business community here can invest in additional opportunities for everybody around Mm -hmm. the entire area. But they need security, right? Dan talked about this a little bit earlier with, we need stability so there's an opportunity for economic improvement, right? All those things go hand in hand. So we're here, right? We're here to do our part to investigate and get the worst offenders off the street and out. We will arrest those people. We'll arrest as many of them as we can, whether it's at the state level, the federal level, the local level, beyond, right? We'll we'll do our job. What we need, though, is a concerted effort that will create jobs and help Mm -hmm. make good education and get families that support each other, communities to raise our kids so that they're running towards opportunities that don't just involve hey, I'm hungry, and so I'm going to go get something that I know doesn't belong to me, but that's how I'm going to get my food today, right? Mm-hmm. We've, got to, we've got to tackle all those problems together, and there are big groups working on this together right now, uh, but, but it's, not a, it's not a quick solution. Dan? Well, I, I think, um, you know, there, there are a number of different things that, that we can do to improve um, public safety in the city of St. Louis. Um, I, I think fundamentally, um, people don't commit crimes because they have something to lose, right? Um, some people might not commit a crime because they have fear of going to jail. Some people might be embarrassed by, you know, what they've done. Um, there are social consequences, um, you know, and then some people just, just feel that it's the wrong thing to do. Um, so I think we've got to attack all of those different areas. Uh, first and foremost, like Jay said, you know, in, in the business of policing, uh, we're here to, you know, catch the people who have done something wrong, uh, present a case to the circuit attorney's office or to the prosecutor, and hold those individuals accountable. And so hopefully from removing them from the street, um, then, um, you know, they're less likely to commit a crime in the future. That's the hope. But in addition to that, uh, some of the things that I talked about in the past is really, you know, we don't have a good safety net system for people who are, you know, in these neighborhoods that need uh, resources. And so, you know, that's something that we've got to build up. We've never, in my opinion, in urban areas invested that much into those components. And so it's not going to be one thing that gets it done. Yeah, it's going to be uh, multiple different efforts, I think, that will have a sustainable impact. But I do get to the point um, that uh, unless we, you know, lower the temperature, it's hard for those things to take root. So fundamentally at the root and at the beginning, um, we need law enforcement. We need the criminal justice system uh, to be fair, um, but also to hold people accountable as 
all those other things start to take root. And Dan, you and I have talked in Pruitt, and and I'm, I'm I appreciate this opportunity to be in the space with Jay. I make I make it very clear. I am I am not anti police. I'm I'm very pro law enforcement. I'm anti bad police. I'm anti bad. Right. So you you and I have talked about this. We've had this discussion. And I always say, too, when it comes to public safety, we can't lead with enforcement. We have to lead with prevention. I mean, even we talk yes. about intervention. I, and, and I think it's, it's all three. It's like you said, it's, it's not either or. It's all of the above. It is prevention. And, and, and y'all can't do the political thing, but I can. We need more money in prevention. We need to start early. I'm glad that Jay and them are going down to Matthew Dickey and, 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 and being visible there. I think that that is important. But, you know, you and I have talked. When we talk about public safety, prevention, intervention, enforcement, I get it. I understand it. But I'm always going to be that guy on the left that says if we are not, like you just said, if we are not helping to develop communities and strengthen families, then that's what we're going to get on the other end. And finally, for me, because I'm a preacher, I always get three finalies. I'm a Baptist preacher. Is that on the <laughs> other end of, well, y'all know that's right. Y'all know how I roll. On the, even in, with enforcement, it's one thing to put people in. It's one thing to arrest and incarcerate. But I remember back in the day we had this word called rehabilitation. Back in the day. We talked about rehabilitation. We did. But I don't hear that word a lot now when we talk. We talk about mass incarceration, but we don't talk about rehabilitation. So if people are coming back into the same situation, same circumstances, same environment as they left, then Jay's job, Dan, and your job it's just, you know, you guys will continue to have a job. We'll try. I want to put y'all both out of a job. I want y'all to start teaching economics and engineering somewhere. Uh, that's <laughs> well, my hope. That's my well, hope. Well, that's another show. That will be another, that's, that's, yeah, a, right, that's right. another show. Listen, ladies and gentlemen, we were, we were glad that you had a chance to sit in with us and hear this conversation. We are so thankful for Jay for you being here yeah. and sitting in winners on the show. And, and Dan, of course, we're just as grateful that you were able to join us. Even more grateful, Frat. Don't let, don't let poor oh do that. Oh, my God. And, and, <laughs> and he, he keeps taking up time that he doesn't have. <laughs> I told you I was a preacher. <laughs> but listen, we, we're going to wrap this show up. We appreciate everybody listening in. We look forward to, for, look forward to seeing you and hearing you and you hearing us on the radio Next week, same time, same station. And that station is, Daryl? It is Hallelujah, 1600 AM. Or go to the iHeart I Radio app. You can pull us up there, too. And we're going to be on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Check us out on social media. It is Point Black.